And I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me such beautiful brothers and sisters in Islam and for our guests as well to be here with us. Before I go any further, what I'd like to do is a little inventory check to find out how many Muslims do we have with us tonight. If you raise your hand, I'd like to see how many Muslims are here. Whoa. Well, let's go the other way then. How many non-Muslims do we have with us? Any non-Muslims here tonight? One? Did somebody see one? Where? We do have one, right? Huh? I wonder how it feels to be surrounded by all these terrorists. Anyway. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. The subject tonight, I'm going to kind of jump right at it, is one that I really feel strong about, is being able to communicate what's beyond the differences. And the first thing to do is to talk a little bit about what is Islam, then how it is different from other things, and then what's beyond that. First and foremost, I always like to do what's called etymology. And that's where you take the words down to the core or to the root to understand what they mean, where they come from, and then it makes it easier for people to understand what you're saying. If you work in the medical profession, there are certain words that you understand and you understand them in a way that maybe a layman wouldn't understand it that way. If you work as a mechanic in a shop and you're talking about certain things about an automobile, then again, someone not familiar with the trade would be confused and maybe get the wrong idea. And so it's the same when we begin to talk about Islam. And the reason for that is because Islam is in the Arabic language. Not just the Quran, but everything related to it. The word itself, Islam, is not an English word. It stayed in Arabic. Nobody translates it. So let's do that. Let's begin with that. What is Islam? And a lot of times, those who, maybe they mean well, but not really skilled in translating or giving an idea to the folks. They'll say, what is Islam? They say, it's peace. Islam is peace. We won't argue that there's peace with Islam, nor would we argue that the word peace is actually in the word Islam, but Islam itself doesn't mean peace. Otherwise, when I greeted you, I would have said, Islam alaikum. And of course, you wouldn't do that. Salaamu alaykum. Okay. What is Islam? So let's take the word. The root is sin, lam, mim. Those are the three letters for the root. And silm, if you want to try to pronounce the root, nobody does that. Aslam, taslim, istislam, and salam, etc. All of these are coming from this. Now, if you don't know Arabic, you're going, what's he talking about? In English, it might be better to translate the meaning as surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace. These are verbs or actions. Religions, for the most part, are named after a person, a place, or a thing. They're nouns. So those who are not acquainted with this will think that Islam is the same way. It's a noun. Whereas it's not actually, it's a verb. It demonstrates really what you're supposed to be doing. What are you supposed to be doing? And it implies that you're surrendering your free will, your choices to the one who has the big will over everything, which would be God in the English language, Dios in the Spanish language, or Allah in the Arabic language. Now, some people might say, well, I don't believe that the word Allah actually means God. And you know what I'm going to tell them? You're right. Because it means a lot more. In the English language, they have a word for things that are worshipped. It's called gods. Anything can be worshipped. 
An object of worship could be a chair, a tree, a rock, a stick, a stone, a bone, a concept, a person. All of these things could be worshipped. They're called gods. But is there a word in the English language to denote the one and only true God? And they say, of course there is. What's the word? God. Isn't it spelled the same way? Yeah, but it has a big G. Well, I can't tell if you're talking to me. I guess you'd have to say, I'm talking about big G-O-D. Because English actually is very deficient in many ways when we begin to talk about belief and especially in religion. However, Arabic is the opposite. It's very, very adapted to this subject of belief in religion. I'd like to give you a little insight into that. There is a word in Arabic that exactly describes the word G-O-D, God. It's called Elah. Not Allah, Elah. Elah, that means a God. It can be a God, or you can say the God, Al-Elah. That means the God. Like that is the God that the man worships, that tree over there. It can be made plural, aliha, that's the plural, more than one. In English, all you do is go tss after a word and that's the plural, tss, God, tss, rocks, chairs, tss, cars, tss. you just make the sound of a snake after something and that means more than one, tss. In Arabic, the word is built in a way that when you make it plural, there's no mistaking what you're saying. It's very clear. If you say book in English, okay. But in Arabic, you say kitab and kutab. Kutab is the plural of kitab. You're not going to make a mistake when you hear it. You know he meant more than one book. And if you said masjid, in English, mosque, tss. but in Arabic, masajid, right? Hand, tss. in English, yad, or yadain, right? Or is that two? How many of you know? What's the infinite number? Do you know how to pronounce it? It's a trick question. It's the same word. Yeah, they stays the same. Anyhow, come back to our subject. The word Allah comes from Elah, but when it reaches this perfected state, it cannot be made plural. The word Allah can't be plural. It's always singular. There's no way to change it. Nor can you give it male or female gender. It's without gender, whereas gods could also be goddesses. You could always play with it, it's easy. So it never really denotes exactly what you're trying to say, but in Arabic it exactly says the only one, God. The only one worthy to be worshipped, because it's only one. And it can't be male or female because what? God is not like a human being. So this is a perfect word to use. And for the benefit of Christians or Jews who might like to establish a debate on the subject, I would call them to read their own book. The Arabic Bible has been around for several thousand years, the Old Testament, a couple thousand years in the New Testament. Are there any Arab Christians? Of course there are, many. Do they have a Bible? Mm -hmm. So if you just open it to the Old Testament, now that would be for the Jews, wouldn't it? Old Testament, Jews and Christians believe in it. Open page one. The word Allah is 17 times on page one. So therefore, it must be a pretty good word for them too. So that settles the argument. There's nothing else to talk about there. There is not a difference. This is the God of Adam. 
very clearly states in Genesis that it is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six days. The only thing in the Bible it says, and then he rested. The God that we know about in Islam doesn't rest. He doesn't rest, he doesn't sleep, because he's God. It's kind of scary to think that God would go, let me take a day off here. <laughs> Gotta rest, man. Set the alarm clock. Wake me up, you know, I gotta. <laughs> and I'm sure that whoever translated that didn't mean it that way because we know from the Quran that it says that He is the one who Allah the wal Feast Ayum. He's the one who created the heavens and the earth in six periods of time. Thuma astawa al al arsh which means, and then he rose, and then he rose above his creation and over his throne. He went out away from the creation, up over his throne in a way that suits his majesty, and we don't try to define that. But probably in translation they said, well, he rested on it, you know, without meaning to say it that way. Good question. Anyhow, we've now talked about two words. Allah and Islam. Because we now know who is Allah, we understand the verb. It means that when a person wants to do Islam, what they're saying basically is, I'm going to give up my lusts, my desires, my bad habits, my bad ways. I'm going to give all that up in favor of doing things the way that God wants me to do it. That's what it means. And whoever does it, in English, again, back to good old English, when you have a verb and you want to show the one performing the verb, you add the suffix er after it. Walk, er, somebody who walks. Talk, er, somebody who talks. Think, er, somebody who thinks. Stink, er, some, no, never, sorry, got carried away. Anyhow. <laughs> So when someone islams, in Arabic you don't put er after it because Arabic uses the prefix mu before the verb. For instance, when you travel in Arabic, this is safar. And the one who travels is a musafar. And sometimes when I travel, I suffer, but that's another story. <laughs> the one who speaks, taqalam, mutakalam. The one who gives the adhan is a muadhan. The one who makes sali, salah prayer, he's musali. You put mu in front of it. If he has iman, he's a mu'min. It's very beautiful, isn't it? So in Arabic, it becomes real clear, whoever islams is a mu Islam, Muslim. Muslim, not Muslim, Muslim. And by the way, whenever you're telling somebody in English, don't, don't think that you translated Muslim to English by saying Muslim, because it's too close to Muslim. And we don't want to be Muslim because that's uh, <laughs> wrongdoers. Did it to ourselves or oppressing ourselves or something like that. We don't do it that way. Okay. We got three words now Islam, Allah, and Muslim. What are the differences? Well, when somebody really understands it, a lot of times I say, well, wait a minute, well, I don't see a big difference here. Initially, at least, no. Because according to the Bible, if somebody is a Jew, he knows that there's only one that you're supposed to worship. Very clearly stating in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, the book of Deuteronomy, Chapter 5, make it real clear with what they call the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt in the house of bondage. You know no other God beside me. Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. And that's God talking. It's real clear. First commandment in both of those two books that I just mentioned. There is also 
in the New Testament, a statement according to what we have, what survives of the Bible. We don't have the original anymore, but we have some translations. They ask Jesus, and Jesus answers them. The question is, what is the great commandment? What's the greatest commandment? He said, to know, O Israel, that the Lord your God is one Lord, and you have to love him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? That's not an argument, is it? It sounds like the same thing we just heard from the Old Testament, doesn't it? It's interesting, too, that he said, No, O Israel, because we also find in the New Testament, he said, I've only been sent to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. When we look to the Quran, we find, again, same thing, telling us that religion or actually our way of life, I want to translate a word here, deen, right from the beginning to a better word. Now this needs retranslation. Everything up to now, I've just been uh, breaking down the words for you. But in this case, there's a word that's been translated for several hundred years to English as religion. And it doesn't really work because it's not encompassing enough. And it wasn't until I made a comparison to some references in the New Testament in the old Aramaic language and translation Kone Greek that I was able to come up with maybe a better word for us to use. The word deen in Arabic is more suitable, I believe, to be called the way, the way that somebody does something. The reason I mention that is because if we look to the Quran, we find that this word is used a lot a lot, usually referring to the way of Islam, Islamadeen, Islamadini and Islamadina and Islamadeen. These, depending on how it's used in the sentence, these references, you could usually say religion except when you see Surah al kafirun because in Surah al kafirun the disbelievers the last statement here tells you what to say to somebody than when you give up on them. You know, they, they want to worship some other thing or, in, in fact, they may be a total atheist. You say, lakum dinakum waliyadin. You can say this to an atheist who has no religion. So how could you say to your religion if he's an atheist? But you could say to you, your way of life, and to me, my way of life. So it makes a, a better picture. I did talk to several of the scholars of the Arabic language and teachers that I know, and they said, that's excellent. Use that because it conveys a better picture of what we're trying to say, especially because it doesn't time date something by saying this is only coming with Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a new religion, when in fact it didn't. In fact, another reference to that word deen is doubling up real quick when you hear in Surat al-Bayna, chapter 98 of the Quran, if you use the numbers like I do, you see that Allah talks about the people before the Muslims, meaning who? Christians and Jews. And he says, you heard the word deen in there. I'm going to go real slow. More or less the meaning. And they, meaning those people before, were not ordered anything more than to worship Allah alone without any partners. Keep the way pure for him Establish the worship, salah. Pay the charity to the poor, zakah. And this is the way, meaning ordained by God, most clear. Make sense? Now what's beautiful about this is when you present it this way, 
you can't really get a decent argument going with the folks who preach Christianity or Judaism. Because in fact, that's what their book says, same thing. So this actually eliminates a difference. Because one of the complaints that we hear very often is, well, your religion came after other religions and it's made up. In fact, Muhammad, peace be upon him, never claimed to made up a new religion. He never said that, nor did any of his followers. They all claimed to be following the same way of monotheism, Hunatha, as was followed by Moses and Noah and Abraham and even Adam. Following what? The way. Real quick references in chapter 24, chapter 7, and chapter mm, 22 of, in the Bible of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. The word way is used to represent the people following Jesus. They were never called Christians. They were called people of the way, and they capitalized it with a big W so that you would know that was the name of what they did. That was the proper noun. In Arabic and Hebrew and Aramaic, the Semitic languages, there are no capital letters. You have to know a proper noun by its meaning and also the word al or el in front of it. So when I saw this big W, there and it's still in the translation that we find today in every hotel and motel when you go in and pull a drawer open by the bed you find a bible in there placed by the gideons just look in there and you'll see it has that big w in it so they were called the people of the way by paul and he was the one who persecuted them he said he was the one who persecuted them even unto death and he called them the people of the way three times and they capitalized the W. In fact, it's Paul who tells us in the Bible they were never called Christians until after Antioch, when he carried the message to Antioch. And that was long after the disciples were uh, persecuted and gone, except for a few. So they were originally called people of the way. The, the way of what? The way of Jesus. What way was the way of Jesus? Now that we need to look at that. And let's be fair about this. According to the Bible, and if we're going to talk about Christianity, I'm sure they wouldn't like me referring to something other than their book, at least to start with, clearly states in the Bible that Jesus submitted his will to the will of God. Not only did he demonstrate it, it talked about him doing it, and then he ordered his companions to do the same. In his most trying situation, which was right before the big event, he prayed all night long in the Garden of Gethsemane with a strange prayer in which he kept saying over and over, let this cup pass from me. Now those who explain the Bible say this means he, there's an event coming up that he doesn't want to participate in because that's what it means. They used to pass a cup or a glass or something to people and each one take a drink and he said, I don't want to take a drink out of that because I don't want to be there. I don't want to be part of that. Let this cup pass from me even still though your will be done. Whose will? He's not talking to himself. Who is he praying to? He's praying to big G, little O-D. Okay, God, Allah. And he's asking, let this cup pass from me but even though your will be done. I'll accept it, but this is what I want. This is what Muslims pray all the time. We say, well, this is what I want, but I'll accept the cutter of Allah. Same thing. Now, when he tells his companions to pray, Matthew chapter 6, he says, pray thus. Our Father. Now, Muslims will have a difference on that. Here's the difference. We're not going to say our Father. Why? A Father is a great thing, no doubt about it. Every one of us has a Father. We love our dads. We even just had Father's Day. Good. For a Muslim, every day is Father's Day, though. 
and every day is Mother's Day. We love our parents very, very much, but we don't compare them to God or God to them. We don't consider ourselves God's children because that puts God on a really low level. We're a creation of God. And we don't inherit God or the other way around. He's God. He's the one who created everything. He's the one in charge of everything. And whatever he says happens. Kun fayakun. And the Bible says the same thing. Be and it is. Same thing. So that's the only problem we're going to have with that. The rest of it, listen to it. Which art in heaven. Yep, we believe that. He's not here on earth. Hallowed be thy name. We'll say hallowed be thy names. Sacred. Hallow means sacred. Like Halloween, it means sacred eve. Hallowed eve. That's what it was the night before All Saints Day on November 1st. Did you know that? Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, God's kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what it says. That's exactly the word Islam, isn't it? God's will, not my will. I'm willing to have his will be done. There it is again. Give us this day our daily bread. Muslims ask for their rizq every day. Lead us not into temptation. We always say, Audhu Billah. Seek refuge with Allah. Deliver us from evil. We say, Audhu Billah means shaitan rizim. Deliver us from the evil one. The shaitan. Forgive us of our trespasses, our evil deeds, as we forgive those that do evil deeds to us. And again, Muslims are instructed to do that. You have to ask Allah to forgive you, make tawbah, and you have to forgive people. Muslims are the most forgiving of all people on earth. If you don't believe it, look to what people have been doing to us even in the last 10 years, Muslims still forgiving. For thine, meaning his, God's, for yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And we say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa bi Allah. So here we have just compared the most important prayer that Jesus ordered to his companions in two of the different gospels, compared it to what Muslims say and believe and do every single day. Gosh, up to this minute, anybody tuning in and listening to me on television or radio would say, well, this guy is trying to say that Christianity and Islam are the same thing. Now we're going to find the difference. Islam describes exactly what you're supposed to be doing in your way. Islam Adina. Do what God wants you to do. Submit to him. Do his will. Follow the commandments. So many of the verses in the New Testament of Jesus and even Paul. I said that because he has a little different slant on the way he presents things. Order us to follow the commandments have to follow the commandments of the Old Testament. Commandments, circumcision. Don't eat pork. Get married. Don't have relationship outside of marriage. All of this is commandments. No zina. It's a commandment. No lying. It's a commandment. Don't deceive people. Don't cheat. These are commandments. Don't envy. What is envy? Hasid. This is everything I just told you is in the Quran. Everything I just said is in Quran. The same thing. Honor your parents. That's like the most important commandment after worshiping God alone. Did you know that? Look, first commandment, what you already told you, thou shalt have no other gods beside God. Second commandment, don't make any images, send them, statues. Objects of worship, pictures, don't do that. Third, 
Don't take God's name in vain. Fourth, remember the holy day and keep it holy. Actually, it says the seventh day and keep it holy. Sabbath. Then it says honor your parents right after that. Then it says don't kill anybody. So look how it's important in the Bible. So important is the treatment of the parents. It's even before not killing anybody. <gasps> By the way, it says the same thing in the Quran. Same way. Parents are first. It's so important. You say, well, you didn't show us any difference yet. I'm going to. What I found in the Bible and what I found in the Quran really don't argue with each other very much. Not really. Where I found the arguments in the people. Uh-oh. There are a lot of people who say, I do Islam, I am a Mu Islam. But they really don't do it. Is that true? And there are a lot of people who claim to represent Christianity, but what they teach isn't what's in the book. This might help us to understand today what the real problem is. Is there anything really wrong with the religion of Abraham? I don't think so. Anything wrong with the religion of Moses? Nope. Anything wrong with the religion of David, Suleiman, or Jesus? Nope. Anything wrong with the way of Muhammad? Of course not. So how come we're having so much problem and difficulty with the people? How about this for an idea? Just think about it for a minute. Maybe none of us are really following our book. Maybe we're just following our nafs. Maybe we're just following our egos. Maybe we're just following a bunch of people with big mouths who have hidden agendas. And some of them aren't very hidden, are they? That could be the problem. Some people want oil. Some people want gold. Some people want drugs. Some people just want to control other people. But none of those things are being properly represented out of the Bible or the Quran. The Bible teaches to give up this life if you want the next life. Quran teaches the same thing. But we, and I'm going to include me, we're all humans, come along and we want this life. Big ho houses, fancy cars, nice clothes, money in the bank. Even so much so that we'll give up a lot. Sacrifice our families even, which is wrong. We're never home. We're gone all the time. When we come home, it's, we're so tired Daddy, can you... No, don't bother me right now. Well, honey, could you just... No, no, don't talk to me right now. I'm, I'm, my mind is, you know, blah, 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 blah. Leave me alone. Any of us ever run into that? Go watch television. Get off my case. I give you the best, man. I give you guys cable TV, you got the big TV screen, you got the computer, we got that new, uh, you know, all that stuff we call Game Boy and it's an Xbox. I hope it's not an X rated box, I don't know. <laughs> got all these little toys to play with, you know. And payments. Oh, the payments. The payments on the house, the payments on the car, the payments on the insurance on the house, and the payments on the insurance on the car. Payments. With interest. Reba. Ah, shake, we got a fetwa for it. You don't have to sell me. <laughs> Just remember what you're going to be doing on Day of Judgment. I want to have my own problems on that day. The Bible orders clearly do not deal in riba. The Bible said that. And then to be sure it said neither a lender nor a borrower 
B. And then it tells them don't deal in usury, doubling and tripling. What do you think the Quran says? Same thing. Only more because it said the one who does it is like one who's possessed by a devil. And it uses the word in Arabic, mesa, meaning to be touched or possessed by a shaitan. And you can't talk to a person once they've dealt in riba because their brain is half dead and the other half's misguided. Allah said that, not me. Not me. And if you're arguing with me in your mind right now, then just ask yourself, well, am I doing that? Oop. Something to think about. I'm picking on Muslims right now, but I'll pick on the Christians. That's fair, right? To keep it even here. They're doing the same thing. Maybe even worse. One of the things that we all know, God is one. We had, we had to hear that somewhere. Yet, in Christianity today, there are various sects of Christianity that claim that God is one, but three at the same time. There's something called the Trinity. Is anybody here that has not heard about the Trinity? Everybody heard about it. Can someone explain that Trinity? Man, I've heard so many priests, preachers, Priests, bishops, try to come up with the answer how one and three can be the same thing. I personally used to try to explain it. We gave many examples how one could be three. But check this out before you waste too much of your time trying to go through these mental gymnastics. There's no word Trinity in the Bible. No. 1,200 plus pages. There's a concordance called Strong's Concordance. And you can go through in alphabetical order and look it up for yourself. There's no word Trinity there. It doesn't exist. No reference to it. There's no word Trinity. And there's no phrase saying God's three. Doesn't happen. It's not there. There's a fabricated verse. Now, this is not from me. Christian scholar F.F. F. Bruce, one of the top in his field, very much a Christian. By the way, he doesn't like Islam, but that's okay. He said the verse in the epistle of John, it's not John the gospel, John the epistle, which means a letter written to somebody named John or written by somebody named John, they're not sure. But the point is, chapter 5, verse 7 is a fabricated verse. There are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and these three are one. That was fabricated about seven or eight hundred years ago. Prior to that, the verse actually was the verse before it. There are three that bear witness. The Father, the Blood, and the Spirit, and these three agree. And it didn't say they're one. And it didn't say they're all in heaven, etc., etc. But it doesn't matter. He said that. There's no trinity, not in the Bible. And everything in the Bible keeps saying you have to say one, one, one. By the way, the word Bible is not in the Bible. Let's jump up to the Quran now. Quran. Quran does not mean Bible. Bible, by the way, is from the word biblios. It's a corrupted word. Biblios is the actual word, Kone Greek. What does it mean? You know? Book. That's all. Just means book. Christ is also a corrupted word. It was Christos. Means what? Messiah. From the word mes, meaning to touch, select, anoint, or appoint. Messiah. Messiah. That's the word. Christ means the Messiah. The one the Jews are looking for, the one referred to in the Quran. Now let's go to the Quran. Look in there for a minute. See what we got. The word Quran means that is being recited. Quran does not mean a book. Quran means recitation. 
The word ikra does not mean read. It means recite. Because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, didn't know how to read, so it'd be kind of a stupid thing to say, wouldn't it? Why would he be ordered to do something he can't do? But he could recite, anybody can recite. He did respond by saying, I'm not a reciter, I don't do that, but he was ordered to recite by the angel. These are the first words that come from the angel Jibril, Gabriel to Muhammad 1400 years ago. Quran, the word Quran is in the Quran, yes or no? Many times. Hey, here's some good news for Christians. The word Bible is in the Quran. It's there. Kitab. The people of the Bible. Ahl Kitab. And it says that their Bible actually came from God originally. Good news. But it also says they corrupted it. Oh well, their own scholars said that too. And guess what else? Trinity, it's in the Quran too. So, for those who want to know about Trinity, go read the Quran. It's right there. It says about the Trinity, Thalath, tell the Christians not to say that. That's wrong. So there you are. Same God revealed all of these revelations. Always agreeing. There are no differences except where the people come in. That's where we find the differences. I took the last 14 years of my life and tried as much as I could within reason to spend that time learning exactly what it is God wants me to do. I felt very compelled to continue reading the different translations of the Bible for several years after I came into Islam to learn the Arabic, study the Arabic, and then learn from the scholars the meaning and study the Hadith, these sayings and teachings of Muhammad, what he said it means. I finally came to the conclusion that the Bible and the Quran really don't have any argument between them, except where the Bible argues with itself. Other than that, they're the same message. When the Bible says something like Son of God, but then it turns around and said that's impossible. The Bible says there's only one Son of God, the only begotten Son, but then it turns around and uses the plural Son with the S after it. Throughout, starting in Genesis, Job, Psalms, and in Psalms, it even says the begotten son. And by the way, that's David. He calls himself the begotten son. And then in the New Testament, it doesn't say Jesus is the son of God. It said Adam is the son of God. And when you get all done reading all these different sons of God, you go back to the Old Testament, you see real clear what we know from the Quran. This, if you want to write it down, is in the book called Numbers. Chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should sin. And God is not the son of man that he should repent. And by the way, Jesus continually called himself the son of man. When I started to question some of the other church leaders that I know, preachers, teachers of Christianity, Guys, how come we didn't ever notice this before? It doesn't say son of God. It says son of man. They said, but it means son of God. I said, why? They said it has a big S. <laughs> but there is no capital letters in the Aramaic language which Jesus spoke. They said, well, you have to read it under inspiration. You got to read it in the spirit. Well, I don't know what kind of spirits you got around here, but I'm not drinking that stuff. Because I see clearly it says son of man here. The book of Ezekiel uses that term to describe the prophet Ezekiel many times starting every chapter. Say, O son of man. Cool. Ya ibn Adam. This would be the Arabic version of the Bible. Say, O son of Adam or son of man. That's a term used for who? The prophet Ezekiel. 
There's no real differences between the Quran and the Bible except when the Bible argues with its own logic. And then we'll have to say, well, you know, you go off and solve your problems and come back when you're done. But the Quran doesn't argue with itself. There is no ikhtilaf in the Quran. There is no argument within the Quran. There are no confrontations in the Quran or differences. And Allah even uses that as one of the proofs when he tells you, if this were from other than Allah, you would find within it many contradictions. And you'll find none. And if you're in doubt about it, Allah says, bring a book like it. 1,400 years and nobody did that. He even offers a Kmart special. Bring 10 chapters like it. Nobody did that. And then, can you believe it? Bring just one like it. And the smallest surah or chapter of the Quran says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن أعتناك الكوثر فصلي لي ربيك وانار إن شاني أكهول أبتار Small sur And yet nobody has been able to bring something like that Not in meaning, not in structure, not in sound not in the ability to be able to be memorized so easily by so many people not Arab. Over 85% of all Muslims today are not Arabs. Yet every single Muslim on the earth has memorized at least a portion of the Quran in the Arabic language. There is no Muslim alive walking and talking who doesn't know how to say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Yet I would be willing to go almost to the extreme the other way and say there is no Christian alive that could tell you what the real Bible said, even one verse. The majority of Muslims on the earth today, and when I say majority, I'm going to say in the high 90s, 90% 90 or better, have memorized chapters of the Quran. Al-Fatiha. Ikhlas, Kulaudu bi Rabbil Falak, Kulaudu bi Rabbin Nas, Ina Atainakul Kawthar, Walas, many chapters. Is that true? How many in here have memorized at least some of the ones that I just mentioned? Raise your hands right now. Look around the room and realize even the children are raising their hands. In Arabic language, memorize these, and this is the same that I've found in every country I've visited. Christians have divided into many groups. Jews have divided into many groups, by the way. Muslims also divided up into groups. I'm not going to pick on the Jews and Christians on this subject. They can do that to themselves. But we have something called Sunni Muslims. We have some called Shiite Muslims. We have some people call themselves Sufi Muslims. We have people call themselves so and so and so and they really will divide up. Some of them get really upset about their particular group. Is that true? They do. But not one of them has a different Quran. All of them reciting out of the same exact Quran from memory. And guess what? Over 9 million human beings today walking on the earth have memorized the entire Quran in the Arabic language and the majority of them are not Arabs. There is no other book on earth like that. Think about that. So there are some differences. The original Bible in the original language doesn't exist. The Quran does. But the nice thing about the Quran, it resolves the issues that the remnant of the Bible present. Helps solve the problems for those who can't quite figure it out. If you're a Christian, the best thing you can do to understand your Bible is pick up the Quran and read it. Highly recommend that. I don't want you to convert. Nope, nope, nope. You can't anyway. It's up to Allah if he wants you to be a Muslim or not. If he wants you to do what's Islam to make you a mu Islam, that's between you and him, not me. It's not my job. I'm just delivering a message.
Message is, there's God. He's one. If you don't worship Him, you're going to be in big trouble. That's it. Go get your Bible. Take a copy of the Quran and sit there and compare. Look for yourself. Tell me what you think. But just keep in mind what you're reading is not the original in the Bible. But what's in the Quran never changed in 1400 years. Differences? I think I laid it out pretty clear. Similarities? I think you can see that too. And they were ordered nothing more than to worship God alone. Without any partners, keeping religion pure for Him, establish Salah, pay the Zakah, without a Kadinu Kayama. And this is the way, the way that God wants you to be in submission to Him. So when he says, in the dina in the law, he'll Islam, he means what? The only religion he, God's going to accept is Islam? That's not fair. You mistranslated one word and didn't translate the other. The only way God is going to accept from you is if you will submit to what he has ordained to be your religion, your way. Why would he accept for you to go make up a religion? Everybody says they don't want a man-made religion, right? You want to make up something? Or you want what God wants? And he says, Hope I didn't misquote the ayah. This is in Surah Al Imran, verse 85. That whoever seeks a way of life other than what God has ordained for them, he is never going to accept it from them, and in the hereafter they'll be with the losers. Al Yaumul Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum. You heard the word Deen again? And Allah said, On this day have I perfected your way of life for you and have conferred my biggest na'ma favor on you and chosen for you to submit to me in Al Islam. Is that complicated? This is the way to solve the problem. The Muslims, you're the biggest group out there hanging on to this message. But at the same time, you're the most guilty because you know the truth. And it's your obligation to live it and teach it by example, by example, so that other people can see what's Islam. They have no other way to find it. Do you think that anybody's going to make a television show and syndicate it and put it on satellite and cable to teach them this? Please, wake up and smell the kahwa. It's never going to happen that way. It never did happen that way. It always came one by one, a human being setting the example and calling the people to the truth. That's how it goes. Dropping your children off in a Muslim school on the weekend isn't how it's going to happen. Even if you put them in Muslim school every day, but you don't live it at home, you're teaching them how to be hypocrites. Is that what you want? You want your children to be hypocrites? You want them to leave Islam? You want your grandchildren to stand in your face and speak to you in harsh terms, call you names, and leave you out on the street? Because guess what? I've watched that in my country. That's what's happened over there. And I don't think you want that over here. Become responsible and stand up like real men in front of your Lord and do what he's ordered his way. And then you'll solve the problem of the differences. You'll be able to show people what's the is now. And if you said it's not easy to do that, you're right. Islam is very easy to understand, but nobody said it was easy to do it. Jannah is great, isn't it? Paradise is fabulous, but it's not free. It doesn't come without a price, does it? 
If you'll allow me to close now, I'd like to just reference a hadith that I use a lot in my profession, or did when I was still working, as a chaplain in the prisons. Kala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ad-dunya sijnu al-mu'min wa jannat al-kafr. Our Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, told us that this material existence that we live in, this dunya, is a prison to a true believer. But it's the only paradise that a disbeliever is ever going to get. If you're trying to build your paradise here, what are you saying? If you're living for this world, what are you telling me? What are you telling your Lord? You don't want to be with him? Is this what you mean? As far as what some of the people allege against us, you know and I know it's bogus. Some of it's, if it wasn't for the ramification that went the, along with it, it would be hilarious. Some of the weird stuff they say. All oh, these Muslim men want to blow themselves up so they can have 70 dancing girls in the paradise or something like that. What is that? What, what is this nonsense? What is the real reason we strive and work as Muslims? So we'll be in paradise so we can see Allah. To be close to the one that we love, which is Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Isn't that true? That's why I said, don't count on these other people to promote our religion for us. You have to live it, show it. May Allah make us of those people who understand this message, I mean. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to be the example for the other people, I mean. May Allah bless our families and unite us together as one family of Muslims, I mean. May Allah forgive us and guide us to do better and change our lives tonight. Amen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me for my poor way of delivering the message and guide me to do better next time. Amen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive everything and give us his jannah for dose. Amen. Subhanakallahumma wa hamdik. Ashadu ila ilaha illa an. Wa astaghfiru wa atubu alaykum. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. There's a beautiful question. The first question of the night is, I don't know. It's almost like somebody put you up to this. It's a good question. How do you become a Muslim? How do you become a Muslim? In the lecture, we were talking about the word Muslim. How does one become a Muslim? First is to recognize there really is God. And he's one. There isn't anything else like him. He is not the creation. He's not in the creation. He doesn't exist everywhere. He is apart and separate from his creation. And he is the only one to turn to for your needs and to be forgiven. Okay? And then second is to do what he wants you to do. Follow his commandments. So if you're ready to say, there's only one God, I want to do what he wants me to do, and live up to that, then all you got to do is just stand up and say it. Somebody stood up. Are you serious? What's going on? Well, somebody here is giving me a compliment. I don't deserve it, but thanks anyway. Somebody is saying, I'm afraid to tell the people at work I'm a Muslim. What? How come they don't know you're a Muslim? How could you have a job and work somewhere and people don't know you're a Muslim? Ladies are wearing hijab, men have beards. I mean, they're bound to ask you. Unless you're shaving off your hijab. Oh, I got it mixed up, didn't I? Oops. I know I made somebody mad. You're supposed to ask me. I know the questions that Muslims are supposed to ask. You're supposed to ask me, is Reba halal? You're supposed to ask me that. You're supposed to ask me if smoking is halal. You're not asking me the right questions, how are you? <laughs> the ones I know the answers to. You're asking about other, the other people coming into Islam. You said, 
Am I able to influence any other Christian ministers or priests, etc.? Actually, Allah is the one that influences the people, but I talked to a lot of them. I did see a, a priest from the Catholic Church, then another priest a year later come to Islam, a bishop, no, an archbishop from the Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox, a Baptist seminary student, an altar boy from the Catholic Church, and a discipler from the Methodist Church, I think it was Methodist, and several nuns. I've met two nuns who were formerly nuns in the Catholic Church and became Muslims, and a number of men and women who were out preaching the good word in Muslim countries trying to convert Muslims who became Muslims. What does the Quran say about women in employment? <laughs> do they keep their wages or do the men take the wives' wages to pay for the bills? <laughs> Why are Muslim men pressuring their women to work? You got three perfect questions. The answer is in Surah An Nisa, chapter 4, verse 34. The first word is Rajulan, which means men. It says, and Allah, I'm going to try to give you the, the meaning to English, that Allah is telling us that the men are responsible for, this is a job, for the maintenance and protection of all women. All men are responsible for all women for maintenance and protection. This includes... And this is now, we go to the Hadith, because the, the Quran is making a general statement. But it includes, but not limited to, shelter, which means the house, food, and of course drink, medical, clothing, and education, and total upkeep of all expenses of any children. Now this job, is two, not one, two jobs. Maintenance and protection. He has to protect her. That means it's his job to explain to her the value of the hijab so that when, and provide her with nice looking clothes, nice hijab. You don't just throw an old black sheet at her and tell her have a nice day. <laughs> and I said not limited to because Although it's not mandatory, it's highly encouraged for him to buy gold, silver, diamonds, emeralds, bracelets, rings, necklaces. Did I mention earrings? How am I doing, ladies? Anybody want to change this for what they call equal rights? I don't think so. I thought so. Thank you. Okay, next, do they keep any wages? If a woman does work, in gainful employment, because women have a lot of work to do anyway. But if she has gainful employment of any kind, or inheritance, or any money given to her, all of it is hers. She never has to pay a cent for anything, except what she wants to buy for herself. That is why in inheritance, women do not inherit as much as men, because the men have to use their inheritance to support all the women. A man is responsible for his mother, his sister, his wife, and his daughter, and any other women who don't have anybody to take care of them, then it's a joint effort of all the men collectively to get money together to take care of those women who don't have provision. So it's not just your own family. You asked why are Muslim men pressuring their women to work? to keep up the payments on that reba that they borrowed at the bank. What does the Quran say about men beating their women? It's in the same verse I just read to you. Same verse, chapter four, verse 34. It continues and it says, for this reason, the reason which I just cited to you, it says, for this reason, the women are devoutly obedient and the meaning is to Allah and to their husbands. 
always Allah is first because you cannot obey the husband if it's disobedience to Allah. Like if a husband said, well, I want you to drink alcohol. Well, you can't because that's against what Allah ordered. And then it continues and it says, and if you fear or if you know that they are committing lewd or lascivious acts. This means she's doing something really bad. It tells you how to deal with her. Because the Arabs used to do this, which was just beat their wives. Anytime they didn't like anything, just beat her up. They had no rights. But here it tells you how to deal with problems. You cannot resort to that. The first thing you start with is it says admonish them. You have to tell them what they're doing wrong and you have to give them time to work it out. If they do not, then you leave their beds and you don't share the bed with them. This means, of course, time. That's going to take more time. If they still continue, then, and there's two ways to understand daraba. One is beat them, and it says in the tafsir, lightly, based on a hadith which said that Prophet ﷺ took a miswak, hit himself, and he said it's like this. However, the hadith is not sahih, but it is used by the scholars. The other way to understand daraba is meaning to return back to them, to the bed, to have intercourse, because this word is also used when it's talking about a camel mating with another camel. And that's correct in the fushah of Allah, Allah Arabiya. And Allah Alam. I'm not telling you what I know, I don't know anything. I'm telling you what the scholars say. What is the punishment for men in the afterlife? It's the same as it is for women. It's called hell. You wanted equal rights. <laughs> By the way, ladies, there's no such thing in Islam as equal rights. Don't ever say that. It's not equal rights. There isn't equality in Islam. It's called equity. And equity is much better than equality. Because if it was equality, you ladies would have to do everything the men did and they would have to do what you do. It would mean that you would pray every single day just like they do. No days off and you know what I mean. <laughs> you would have to fast every single day no matter how you didn't feel so good. And you don't want to do that. And when you're pregnant and carrying a baby, you wouldn't get any kind of concession at all. And you don't want that either. And you don't want to have to go out and support him. He's supposed to support you. Don't let shaitan talk you into that nonsense called women's rights. Because Allah gave you more, more than any woman could think up. Because what he's given you not only will give you success here, but it will ensure that you get success in the afterlife. And trust me, you don't want to play with that. What Allah created, he knows better than us. And the way he tells us to deal with it is based on what he knows. What's my view on this? <laughs> I'm glad I'm not a woman. <laughs> it's not easy to be a woman, regardless regardless of how you look at it, or who said you could do this or not do that, or you know, dress like this or don't dress like that or whatever, it's still hard. Being a girl is not easy. It never was, and it, 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 before Islam, out of Islam or whatever, it's always really hardship, it's difficult. And the Arabs used to recognize that in a strange way, that if a girl was born to their family, they became what they call an Arabic yellow-faced. They become very upset, very upset, and they would take her into the desert and kill her. They would bury her alive in the sand. That's how much they didn't want a girl in their family because it was a disgrace. So, for sure, for sure Allah stopped all of that and gave the women their equity. Problem is, a lot of the ladies don't know what their rights are in Islam. And a lot of it also is that the men aren't giving the ladies their rights. So this is aib on us, we need to do that. 
It's really hard for me because I'm the one lecturing about it. And then I go home and my wife says, well, you said this in your own lecture. And I'm going, ha, ha. <laughs> and my daughters don't help, you know. Daddy. <laughs> okay. Somebody's talking about getting married, talking about the subject of a child in a family. You know, it's a girl, she wants to marry a boy. They're both Muslims, but because of different nationality, the parents object. Who has the say so in this matter in our religion? First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear in the Quran there isn't there isn't such a thing as asabiyah. It's not acceptable for us. We do not have this. We are Muslims and that's it. If you don't want to be a Muslim anymore, then just start saying things like, I'm Lebanese, I'm Pakistani, I'm so-and-so, because you do, you're going right out the door of Islam when you do that. You are many Adam, yes or no. Were there two Adams or one? So regardless of where somebody is born or what their face looks like or their skin color is, they still came from the same source. If you don't, want to take my word for it, go to Sirtul Hujarat, chapter 49, and Allah tells you that he created all of us from one. One. And his wife, Eve, and from these two, here came all these people. Nations and tribes. And he made them different so we can recognize each other. But he started out Surah An-Nisa with something very similar, but in this case, he didn't say Yayu Ladina Amanu, he said Yayu An-Nas, because the other one's talking about believers in, in Surah An-Nisa chapter four, he starts it out telling us, oh human beings, have taqwa for your Rub, your Lord, who created man from a single. Human beings came from a single, and from this one, his mate, and from these two, many men and women. And this is not a joke, it's very uh, uh, severe that a person would look to another person and, uh, and put them down because of where they're from or what they look like. And that's, in general, that's human beings. How about somebody that's been guided in Islam? How about somebody that's a Muslim and knows that the only way your children are gonna get the Jannah is if they stay in Islam and know that if you have a good Muslim daughter and she gets married to a good Muslim boy, your grandchildren get to go to Jannah and as a result, you do too. Isn't that good enough? Or have you got some kind of quirky thing that your children all have to have blue eyes or black hair or what? What? And you still can't control that. They might still come out looking different, right? But it is correct for the parents, it is correct for the parents to investigate a family and if it's based on something they know about the family that's bad, not because they're from a particular island or a continent, but there's something there, then they should warn their child about it and say, I don't think you should marry this person because of a real reason. That's right. But the ultimate, it's in chapter four, verse 19 of the Quran, and that's when you cannot force a woman to get married or not married to anybody. You cannot inherit them against their will. And it means that you cannot take a woman and say, I'm married to you, nor can you force her to get married to somebody else, or nor can you tell her that she has no choice in the matter. She should listen to her parents as long as they don't order to do something against Islam. That verse is in chapter 31, Surah Luqman, when Luqman is telling his children the same thing. So, I want our children, though, to understand that your parents do have rights, regardless of your age. Even if you're 50 years old, your parents still have rights. And when you marry a family, if you know your family doesn't like that family, you are causing a real division in your own family. Because whenever your children are born, where will they go? 
Who will they visit? These grandparents don't like those grandparents. So be careful of that. Do think about that. But then also try to pray and ask a lot to guide all of us that we don't have this because it's a very serious condition. When you have this asabiyah, this is the opposite of Islam. Asabiyah. By the way, I need to translate that, don't I? What, 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 what would you say? Asabiyah is uh, prejudice. Like my group's better than your group. Prejudice. Many sisters, here's the next question, do not wear the hijab. Can you speak about the importance of covering? Well, one time I just got a general question. It says, do Muslim women have to wear a hijab? The answer is no. Just don't go outside. Because she doesn't. I want to give you an example about that. I want you to think about this. There is something in Islam called aura. The aura is the forbidden area which no one is allowed to see. Not even your mom, your dad, or your, uh, you know, your kids or anything. Once you reach uh, maturity, when you're little, it doesn't matter. But when you, when you reach maturity, the area from the navel to the knee must be covered. That's men and women. So a woman, when she has a baby, she can expose herself on the top to feed her baby. And men that are her brother or her husband or her father, they can see this and it's, it's not against Islam. That is not against Islam. He may not want to, okay? He might like, oh, wow, let me get out of here. But it isn't haram. But if a man is present who is not of the immediate family, and those are referenced by, and Allah listed the whole list. This is in chapter 24, Surah An Nur, verse 31. The whole list is right there. If he's not one of those, then she must draw the khimar over the juyu behinna. And that's the word in Arabic. And they wore a khimar which was like this, and they used to wear it in the back. Let's see if I can do that. It was Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal that actually did something like this when he was trying to give the demonstration. They used to wear it something like this, and then they were ordered to draw it down over the front. So this is basically what happened. They pull it down over the front like this. Of course, it was in two pieces. And then he did it so that he had, didn't have glasses on, so that he had one eye showing like this, and he was showing them that this is the way and Allah knows best. The thing is, a woman knows from when she's real young. She can attract men's attention with a lot of different things. One of them is the way she walks. So Allah talks about that in the Quran too. One of them is the way that she talks. That's also something in Islam you have to be careful. Like when you answer the phone, you don't say, hello. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. That's wrong. Because her voice becomes a part of the aura. According to some of the fuqaha scholars of fiqh. There's another verse in the Quran in Surah Al Hisab, chapter 33, ayah number 59. And it tells, Ya Yuan Nabi, that means, O oh my prophet, tell your azwajika wa binatika, which means your wives and your daughters and the believing women. So this is not like some brother said, oh, that's only for the prophet and his wives. And no, you didn't want to read the rest of it. Tell the believing women too. That whenever they go out, this means when they go out away from the house area, when they're really going to go out somewhere. Because when you work around the house, in the yard, maybe you're washing dishes, things like that, you wear a general hijab. I saw the best demonstration when I was in Upper Egypt. I saw it. And the women around their house, they were wearing a hijab, but it was obvious, you know, that they were working. They would have their sleeves all the way up to here, washing and doing things. But whenever they were going to leave their house, even to go down the road a bit, they drew their abaya around them 
and cover themselves up even more. And that demonstrates real clear what we read in uh, the Confederates or Al Hasab. As far as wearing the hijab, Shaitan will come to you and try to give you a million reasons not to do it. He will trick you. He will tell you, oh, well, you're not supposed to be conspicuous, but if you wore it here, you'd be conspicuous, so don't wear it. Good trick, but still wrong, because the law is real clear in what he wants you to do. If you're the only person on earth wearing the hijab, do it for Allah, but do it. And brothers, that's where the protection comes in. If she's not going to wear it, she can stay home. But if she's going to go out, it's your job to be sure she wears it. There's a hadith that says four will be punished for a woman who doesn't wear her job. Her father, her brother, her husband, and her son. Do you want your men and your family punished? It's up to you. If the man doesn't want you to wear it, that's kind of like a woman who doesn't want her husband to grow the beard. She wants him to shave it off so he'll look like another woman. It's kind of weird is what I'm saying. But Allah said in the Quran, you cannot obey anybody when it's against what Allah teaches. By the way, if you want to get mad at me, it's okay. I don't care. Because I'm only saying this for your benefit. Because I love you. You're my real brothers. You're my real sisters. I want to go to Jannah. I really want to go. And I want all of us there. And we're not going to get there by pranking around and playing with this Islam. It's not going to happen. We're going to suffer here and then the next life. And I don't want that. I don't want to spend one second in hellfire. Do you? And so far, the shortest duration that I heard about being in hellfire, there are a lot of Muslims are going to get out. That's the good news. Bad news is the shortest duration I heard about so far is 400,000 years. And that's not acceptable for me. I can't buy that. No. You're asking if a woman has an adopted son, but she has daughters, can their adopted brother see them without hijab? There is a book translated to English by one of the students of Ibn Taymiyyah, I think it's Ibn Al-Qayyim, but I'm not positive. It's called the Tafsir of Surat al-Hijra. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm not sure exactly which of the scholars wrote it in Arabic, but the translation is by Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. In there, he discusses in detail and it's translated by Dr. Phillips, that Muslims cannot adopt. We cannot adopt. One, you cannot change somebody's last name. You can change their first name if it means something bad, you know, in Islam. But the last name needs to be there. They need to know who they are because we don't want them to accidentally marry from somebody that are too close to them. And it could happen. You can raise somebody, because the Prophet Islam did that. But it was shown to us in the Quran that this boy that he considered like an adopted son wasn't his son and couldn't be considered that way because he was not allowed to see Aisha. He was not allowed to see any of the wives of the Prophet because that wasn't his son. And also, when he divorced Zainab, the Prophet married her because that was not his son. And you cannot marry, a man cannot marry a woman that's been married to his son. That's the best I remember on that one. Law. If a woman wants to divorce her husband, but he refuses, what are her rights? It's interesting, you know what, a lot of people have this one mixed up. They think that a man has all the control. He can just walk up to a woman and go, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you spit on her shoes and walk out the door. That's not how it works. 
the man must go through three stages, three stages, and pronounce divorce on three separate occasions. This is in a book, Al Bulugar Maram, on the subject of talaq. And it's in the, I don't remember the number, but it's in the last part of the book where it talks about this subject that a man actually pronounced divorce three times in a row on his wife and went out the door and said, I'm, that's it, I'm finished with her. They came and they asked, is, is that a real divorce? Prophet Sallallahu said, they're divorced, but he is not from us. Because this is wrong. This is not the way we do it. But because they want the divorce and that's the way he did it, but this is not the Islam way. So a man cannot do that not and still be a good Muslim. He has to go through the stages. And I'll refer back again, Dr. Jamal Bedawi refers to the verse that I read to you in chapter four, verse 34, when he says that these stages, when you warn the woman, admonish her, leave the bed from her, and then finally either go back to her or leave her permanently are the three stages of pronouncing divorce. But that's his opinion. He has some support for that. Allah Alam. But the woman, and this is also mentioned in the same book, if she really wants to be divorced, there's nothing you can do to keep her. Proof? Not only is it in the book of Baluga Maram, it's in the Quran very clear in the Quran when it's talking in Surah Al-Hasab, ayah number, I think this is uh, 39 or 40, I can't remember, uh, 39 or 41, it's not 40, because 40 is one that says, Muhammad is not the father of any of your men, but uh, he's the Khatam Nabiya. But it's right in that area, right around there. It says that the Prophet Sallallahu wants to, you know, he wants to get married to Zainab. But if you read the tafsir, you understand she divorced her husband and she based it on what? She can't stand to look at him. He turns her off. And that was it. She did not say it three times. She said it once. But she said it with sincerity and that was it. They were divorced. What the woman should do and Allah tells us in the Quran, sisters, listen, when you have a dispute in your family, the first thing you do, neither one of you jump up and start talking about divorce. You bring members of your family, members of the man's family, and they sit together and try to resolve the issues and bring proof out of Quran and the Sunnah, Hadith, etc., to help you resolve the issues. If it's unresolvable, then she does have the right to divorce. Khuwa, I think you call it in Arabic. And that's it. They divorce, finish. She only has to make it clear once, not three times. But it's not as easy for the woman because she does have to go get like uh, the imam or somebody to uh, accept this and then they have to Depending on what country you live in, there's some legal paperwork has to be done too. It's not easy. I don't recommend to get married in a hurry and then wind up getting a divorce. But also, sometimes there are things that are just, you can't, you can't work it out. Pray real hard, ask Allah. How does a woman deal with her husband when he wants to marry a second wife? And how can she prevent it? Oh, really? Well, first of all, sister, I don't know if you read this or not, same book, Quran, same chapter on Nisa, chapter four, verse three, I think it is. It's talking initially about how we deal with orphans, the yatim, and their inheritance. And it's telling us do not mix their inheritance with our money, don't take their wealth, mixing it in with ours, trying to improve our conditions, pretending that we're benefiting them. And don't marry these orphan girls trying to swallow up their wealth, because that was a habit people used to have. As, you know, that's a pretty cool deal. There's an orphan kid, I'll say that's my wife and take all her stuff and whatever. But Allah forbid that because women have rights. 
You cannot do that. And you say, well, I want to get married, and she's, you know, an eligible girl. Well, guess what? Well, I said, no, don't do that, but rather marry women of your choice, believing women of your choice. Who? And he says, two. His name, two. Two is the first number, sister. Or three. Or four. If you can treat them with equality. If you can't, then you're only allowed to marry one. My wife said about marrying another woman that if I was going to treat her with the equality, it would be haram. And I said, why? She said, you shouldn't treat another woman as bad as you treat me. <laughs> Seriously, I'm, that's a joke. She actually told me early on, if I wanted another wife, that that was fine. Because she said, I want to be a good Muslim and I want to do what Allah wants. I've always thought that that was like a psychological trick, you know, it's like reverse psychology. Go ahead. But it's kind of like, and then what are you going to do? No, that's all right. Go ahead. Uh, like what, though? Because <laughs> I do remember one time I was joking around with her kid and I said something I don't remember. And I remember her comment, you have to go to sleep sometime. <laughs> she has this huge 16-inch frying pan, solid iron, hanging on the wall. She's never cooked anything in it yet. I don't know. And besides, I can't even pay what I've got. How would I be able to afford another wife? Before anybody could even talk about it, he'd have, he could not have any debt on a house because how could you go out and start another house with another debt? Which is, I mean, we're talking big haram there. You can't do it. You, at first, he'd have to have everything cleared away without any reba on it. And I'm not saying anybody here would do that, but... He'd have to have all that cleared and then be able to duplicate. He'd have to have an equal house. It doesn't have to be the same color or anything, but something of equal value of a house for the other lady. Car. Clothes. Guys. It's not worth it. But, sister, to answer your question, it isn't your right to change Islam. Allah gave him that right. There are some points about it. If the man is not able to give the women their rights, he can't do it. And in some countries, he can't. Because if it's her right, as an example, in marriage, to inherit because he dies, she should be able to inherit. Well, the other lady can't inherit because of the laws of that particular country, only favor one wife, and they said, no, we don't recognize the girlfriend over here. Whoops. So that wouldn't be fair. Nor would it be fair for her children, because they don't really have a father, according to the law of that particular country. So you have to understand that a lot of the things that, that you hear scholars talk about, they're talking about in the ideal Islamic state. And I don't live in the ideal Islamic state. In fact, I live in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I don't even want to go there, but anyhow. And then also, there's some stuff that I'm not going to go into simply because I, <laughs> I know you're recording it, and I don't want my wife to find out. <laughs> but uh, I understand that this is something especially especially for men who want more children, they want a lot of children, and men who are energetic, let's use that word. I'll tell you one thing, ladies, you know the psychology better than I do. If you try to keep a guy from doing something, you're just going to force him into it. Just take it easy, make dua to Allah, and if he does, so what? The Prophet ﷺ had many wives, yes or no? Didn't he? Yes or no? Okay, get over it. <laughs> Here's a good one. I like this one. Why can a man marry a non-Muslim but a female can't? 
Read the Quran real close next time in Arabic and look what it says. Believers marry believers. That's what it says. The Muslim man marries Muslim women. He can marry from the Ahl Kitab. You didn't mention it that way. You made it sound like just non-Muslim. A man, a Muslim, cannot marry non-Muslims, non-believers. He can't marry a Hindu. He can't marry a Buddhist or an atheist or a Republican. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Local joke, sorry. But for sure, the Quran limits that and it gives him that right. See, men travel a lot. Okay, men, Muslim men have always been traveling, going around the world, sharing the message of Islam. And how would it be if a man's been traveling for a year and he's way out in China, the closest thing that he has is a Christian lady, let's say. Okay. She's a believer. He wants to get married. What's he got to do? Go all the way back to find a Muslim? Or can he marry this believing lady with the understanding that he's going to try to help her get closer to Islam? And men always have influence on their wives. They always do. But if she stayed as a good Christian lady, she could still bring the children up and him there, of course, helping them to stay in the right way. That's the idea. Now, The other condition, beside being a believer, it says real clear, she has to be a virgin. So as far as that goes in the whole entire continent of Australia, I heard about your beaches, guys. <laughs> Forget about it. You didn't read that part? She has to be a believer and a virgin. The only way is if she became a Muslim, then she becomes back to that state of virgin. Otherwise, forget about it, guys. Never happened. You know that. You didn't ask about the four wives. You should have asked that one. How come a man can have four wives, but a woman can only have one husband? Islam brings about what? Equity. Say it. Islam gives me equity, not equality. Do you want equality, really? Stop and think, because watch what happens in this one. This is one of the most amazing, and non-Muslim women, when they hear this one, they're shocked. Because I had one come to me one time, an older woman came to me, I want to know how come you Muslim men, she's from the South like me, how come you Muslim men can have four wives and a woman can only have one husband? Say, okay. I said, ma'am, are you married? Yeah. <laughs> could, could you do something for me? Could you imagine, just for a minute, close your eyes, imagine your husband, your own husband. Think about it for a minute, how he is. You know, like he just came home from work, you know, plopped down in front of the TV, told you to go get a beer, you know. Uh, you know what I'm saying? She said, okay. Would you like to have another one just like him? She said, no. I said, then why would you want four? But I would like to answer your question. First of all, at the time of Muhammad Salaam, there were more women than men. A lot more women than men. And today, according to one statistic I heard on television, there are more than 30 women for every man on earth. More than 30 women for every man on earth. Who will take care of these women? Because it says in the Quran, the men have to take care of the women. And the Prophet ﷺ had the opportunity to take care of a woman. He wanted to help take care of her. She needed care. She needed somebody to love her, to be kind to her, to feed her, to give her, you know. But she didn't have any member of her family living. So rather than go hang out at her house once in a while and drop stuff by, hey, babe, what's up? He married her, although he never slept with her. But he married her. 
It was a legitimate relationship that they had. Even though they didn't have any intimate relationship, he could still go and sit in the house and be in private, listen to her talk about her problems, etc., etc. And nobody could say anything because that's his wife. Now, the rule in Islam isn't like you think. It's upside down because it's being presented to you by non-Muslims. Let's listen again. A man cannot get married to a woman if she's already married. That's the rule. A man cannot get married to a woman that's already married. Read the Quran. That's what it says. He cannot marry a woman that's already married. But a woman can choose from any man in the community as long as he doesn't have four wives. You're the one who get the advantage because you can say, okay, I see how jihad treats his wife. He gives her this and this and this and this. He never beats her. In fact, she beats him sometimes. <laughs> that's a pretty cool dude. I want that guy for me. And that's no problem. You got an expanded choice. The men got limited. Men can only choose from unmarried women. If there's only one, that's all he can choose from, isn't it? But the women can choose from every single man in the community except her own father, brother, son, etc. like that or if he has four wives. So let's put it in perspective and stop reading these garbage magazines and listening to the radio and TV. Well, this is what the scholar, I, I really didn't give you a good scholarly answer because I'm supposed to give you the rest of it too. One of the things scholars always mention, although this didn't say it in the Quran, but they go into more detail because when she has a child, the child has rights in Islam to inheritance. How would you know who the father is? Today they can do a DNA testing. In fact, if you ever heard of Jerry Springer, they'd like to do that all the time. Of course, those people aren't married, so I don't know what the point is. <coughs> what do you do if you want to wear hijab and the husband said no? Well, you either have to stay home all the time, and you can make his life miserable, you can do that. And he'll finally let you go out. Um, or you're just going to have to put it on and go because uh, you don't have a choice. You can't, you can't break the rules of Islam to please me or anybody else. This is, Islam is not about you and somebody. It's about you and Allah. If you want to be in Islam as a Mu Islam, that is your only choice. You either do it or you don't. The rule is there. But whatever you do, don't lie. You would be better off, listen to me, as if a person, for instance, said, well, what about pork? What about eating pork? Is pork something against Islam? And the answer is absolutely, positively, yes. Many verses in the Quran said, haram, haram, haram khanzir, no pork, forbidden, right? So if a person ate pork, they like bacon, for instance, they said, that's chewy stuff, I like to eat that. That's haram and they can be punished, true? But if they said it's not haram in Islam, even if they never ate it, by saying that, they went out of Islam. They have left Islam because they know that's wrong and they are going against what Allah has said. Reference for it, what I just said, I'm not joking with you, is chapter 9 of the Quran, Surah al Tawbah, verse 31, that the Christians and Jews took their priests and monks as partners with Allah. Adi bin Hatim radiallahu anhu said to Rasulullah, no, they don't do that. He said, yes, they do. Do they accept halal and haram from them? which Allah made haram and halal the opposite way. They said, well, yeah. He said, in that way, they were worshiping them. They were making partners with Allah. So this is very wrong. If you know something, it do I heard too many people say, oh, hijab is not really in the Quran. That's a lie. You got two verses I quoted to you over and over. There are many hadiths. They go to Sahih Bukhari. In the English translation of Sahih Bukhari, 
volume 6, chapter 220, hadith number 282. It says that Aisha radiallahu anhu says that when the ayah came in Surah An-Nur, that the Muhajirin, those who made hijra to Medina, these were the Meccan women, that when the verse came, they tore the morts, which is like a waistcoat or so, uh, part of an extra layer of a dress, tore it and wrapped it around their heads and faces. And she made dua for them for that. And then two hadiths later, it's very similar. It's just a different rawayah. So this has more than one rawayah. It's in Sahih Bukhari. You can't argue with it. There are other hadiths talking about the women cover themselves up like black crows. You couldn't see anything. Then if you said, oh, you're being extreme. I'm telling you what it says. You ask me, I'm telling you what it says. The one that's extreme is the one that goes, well, you know, we live in modern times. And that was the Arab custom. And you know, really, Islam is in your heart. And your hijab is in your heart. Boy, when you talk about some major surgery, trying to get that out of there. Don't play with Islam like the people before did. That's exactly what they did. Next question, what is music? Is it haram? Then you said, and what should we do to stop listening? The meaning what? <laughs> you already know it's wrong. The proof? Okay. Bismillah. Allahu Akbar. But what I remember about this is in Surah Al-Luqman, chapter 31, verse 6. It uses the term here about people who take their religion and as idle talk and amusement and Abdullah ibn Abbas, the top scholar of Islam from his generation, a companion of the Prophet he said, this is music, this is music, this is music, and he meant musical instruments. He didn't mean nasheed. He was talking about musical instruments. And the hadith, it's in volume seven of the English translation, hadith number 494b, and it said that the Prophet said that from my followers there will be some who will come and they will make legal, illegal sexual intercourse, wearing silk, drinking alcohol, and musical instruments. We have a contemporary, somebody today, a scholar, wrote a book, Al-Halal wal Haram, and in it he used the same hadith that I just told you, and the same ayah that I just told you, and the same Statement from uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, but he still came out with the opposite meaning and he said, well, I don't see where it's, uh, so it's his idea. But for sure, having been 38 years in the music business personally, knowing other people like Yusuf Islam, who also was in the music, and if you've heard of Tupac, some of you kids heard about Tupac, the one that uh, died, and all that garbage that he's got still coming out. He made 200 of those programs, by the way, before he died. That's where they're getting that now. Before he was shot, that's where it came from. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. One of his running buddies, his homeboys, is named Napoleon. He made Shahada, and he's on the Quran and Sunnah. And we sat together two weeks ago in his house in California, and he clearly laid it out to me. Uh, this is what I already know about the music, and he said that he hates it more than anything, and so do I. And I spent 38 years in that field. We had our own line of pianos called Estes Pianos, and Estes Organs, and guitars, and instruments. And I know for a fact, because we also developed television shows, Estes Music Jamboree, and in our programs, we use music because we know how to use it to trick people or get them to do what we want them to do. And we use music in the malls to pull people into the stores to do different things because we know what it will do. So if you doubt it, and here we've done it, we've treated it like a science, and we know what it does, and we know how to use it, in, especially in church music, to get people motivated to donate their money. Uh-huh. And there's a group 
in the United States right now who said, they just made this up, they're not scholars, but they said it's okay to use music and musical instruments to, if it gets the kids to come to our gatherings because that way they can learn about Islam. If that's true, and the Prophet ﷺ said in the Hadith that they would do this, why not those other things he mentioned too? Why don't you say it's okay to use alcohol if it'll get them to Islam? Or why don't you say it's okay to use illegal sex if it'll get them to Islam? So, don't play with the religion. Some Muslims practice temporary marriage. What's the position of Islam on this? It used to be practiced at the time of the Rasul Sallallahu It's called Zawja Muta. Muta means pleasure. Marriage of pleasure. And what I remember about it is that it was something that they did. He did not forbid it. The Shiites say that it was Omar that forbid it, so they don't listen to this. However, Shiites love Ali radiallahu anhu very much. There is a hadith in the summarized version of Bukhari. I know the number is uh, 1641, but I don't know what it is in the big volumes because I didn't memorize it out of there. But I can show it to you real easy. It's in Sahih Bukhari. It's on the authority of Ali radiallahu anhu, and he said at the Battle of Khaybar, Ghazatul Khaybar, is that how you say it in Arabic? Yes. He said that the Prophet ﷺ forbid two things. Lahm himar wa zawjamuta. That's what it says in If you want to argue with it, take that up with Ali. By the way, lahm himar means donkey meat. He forbid us to eat donkey meat. Any domesticated animal who's working for you, you're not allowed to chomp him up. You know, like you get tired of your horse and your lunch meat. <laughs> I don't know, but that's what it says. It has um, a, a nasty ring to it for me because when you said our oh, temporary marriage has to have, still has to have the uh, mahram, the, uh, what do you call it, dowry. You still have to give it, right? So, and you're saying, well, here's some money to live with me, you know, for two weeks, two months, or even two hours. We have that in Las Vegas. It's legal, it's called prostitution. The other point is, for those who say it's okay, and I've tried this out on one brother who was saying, it's no problem, we can do that. I said, do you have a sister? He said, yeah. I said, can we do that with your sister? He went crazy. He went crazy. I said, why is it so okay for all these other sisters? They're not your sister. You said, fine for them, but not for your sister. So what's that? I want to get married. Not me, the question says. What should I look for in a wife? The Prophet ﷺ told us in a good hadith, it's quoted all the time by the scholars, that there are these things to look for in a wife. It could be that you'd choose her based on her appearance, her looks. It could be that you would choose her based on her social status or her wealth. Or it could be that you would choose her based on her taqwa or her piety, closeness to Allah. And he said, choose them based on the last. So look to that first. Look for a girl who is really somebody who will help you get into paradise. If it turns out she's a rich babe on top of that, okay. But <laughs> I'll do that. But the first and foremost always for boys and girls, look to the piety. And by the way, when you get married, Allah can make your eyes see the beauty in the person. You will see the real beauty in that person, regardless if anybody else does or not. Because the beauty in, in there is going to be reflected by the heart. And know this, your wife in Jannah will be so beautiful. She will be so beautiful that a man will think, well, the first time he sees his wife in Jannah, he'll think it's Allah, because that's how beautiful she'll be. This is according to one of the hadiths that I read in a book, which some of the hadiths weren't all sahih, but I think it's okay. Inshallah. Allah knows best. The mistakes tonight were all from me. 
But if there was any good, that was from Allah. I ask Allah to forgive me. And I ask all of you to be patient with me while I'm still trying to learn about this way or deen of Islam. And enjoyed having the opportunity to be with all of you tonight. I hope, inshallah, that we'll have a chance to be together again and that you will make dua for us to continue this great work and for these brothers who are doing this effort, make dua for them and that Allah guide our youth and keep them in the Surat Mustaqim. I mean, visit our internet website, islamalways.com. And we have a lot of stuff happening over there. You can meet people from around the world in our chat rooms. We have a 24-hour broadcast going on over there. A lot of stuff's happening on the internet. And don't forget to make dua for us. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallahum wa hamdika shahadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa atubu alayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, to lead Words, pray. Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims.